What's going on guys? It's Wednesday. Week has been brutal so far. Work is killing me. Kids is going getting ready to go back to school. That stuff's killing me right now. But it is Wednesday, which means we have new comic book day. But to top it off, we have a brand new hot and cold show. So everything is much gooder right now. Much gooder, right? I made that word up. It's the word. Look it up. Much gooder. But hot and cold list, Jack. This kicks the week off for us. And we got a brand new show tonight where we are covering the hot and cold market trends in the comic community. With me, as always, is my co-host, Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. Hope your week's going better than mine, Jack. Well, Rooster River. Oh, excuse me. I mean, Brian. I got confused with that uh, gooder comment. But, yeah, I'm right there with you, my man. My kids did start school this week. So it has definitely been a long week, and it's only Wednesday. But the great thing about Wednesday is it is new comic book day. And if that doesn't get your blood flowing, if you're not ready to talk about the hot and cold back issue trends in the comic book market, then you'll never be ready. And like you said, this starts off our week. This gets our content week rolling. We've got the CBSI Hot and Cold show tonight. We've got the CBSI Bolo show tomorrow night, followed by the main event, the CBSI Hot 10 Comics list right here on the Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel, the official network of CBSI. So I want to welcome everyone that's been coming into the chat right now. Although we aren't live, we are in this chat with you right now. And I know people are rolling in because the past few weeks have been phenomenal. AJ Styles phenomenal in the chat. Except for AJ Styles. Kind of got his butt kicked this past week, but that's not here nor there. We're talking about comics and we're talking about the hot and cold list. Now this list is prepared by who, Jack? Our absolute spec super team. Now, usually I would say contributors and writers from comicbookinvest.com, but lately we've been bringing people in from all areas of the comic community, YouTube comic community, IG comic community, the Simpleman's Comics Patreon family has stepped up. And this has created this excellent spec super team, bringing you perspectives from all over the internet comic book community. That's right, and we have two guest picks tonight. One is a Simple Man's Comics Patreon member. He also has his own YouTube channel, and we also have a podcast slash gamer who is a good follower on this channel who has another spectacular pick, but we will get into that later. Before we get into the list this week, we do want to bring up some comments that we received from last week's video, starting with we got Andy Adams talking about hot DC Black Label Comics, not DC Young Animal Comics. Now, DC Young Animal Comics, we thought was going to be promising. There are some titles that I actually enjoy. I always say Mother Panic is still one of my favorites, the whole Gerard Way comic line. But what do you think about the cold pick on this one, Jack? Yeah, I, I definitely see that. Um, I don't think the DC Young Animal line really took off the way that DC Comics was hoping for. But I love the hot pick because DC Black Label is about as hot as it gets. And it looks like they're just getting started. Tons of new uh, series are being solicited. And I'm really excited for a lot of them. Right. And then the next comment we have is from Brad Selden who says, Yo, Joe, cold pick Kirkman's Oblivion Song 1 and 2. Hot pick Absolute Carnage number 1, that sketch party variant, which was one per store. We've kind of discussed this on the Hot Cold, especially on the Bolo Show. But what do you think about these ones, Jack? Well, he had me at Yo Joe. So I, I love both picks. Um, I think Kirkman's Oblivion Song is just a spec cycle. I think it'll have its time back again. And yeah, those one per um, store type sketch variants or, you know, the party variants, premiere variants, all of that type of stuff is doing extremely well. And Absolute Carnage is absolutely hot. No matter what cover we're talking about, that series is on fire. So hot that you're getting blamed for stealing your idea from a college class. Yes, yes. <laughs> then our next comment comes from another absolute fantastic YouTube comic community channel in Wolf Warner. And he says, Source Point Press, been a sleeper. Awesome, Dan. This is in regards to Dan's hot pick last week about Source Point Press. We all know they've been hot for a good while. Dead End Kids number two came out this week. But what do you think about this? Well, definitely, Source Point Press is on fire. Um, I think we're going to see them on the CBSI Bolo list. Um, a matter of fact, it's Wednesday. So, yeah, they're on the CBSI Bolo list, and you're going to see it tomorrow night uh, right here on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. And another thing you're going to see on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel is that commenter himself, Wolf Warner, coming soon to the Hot and Cold Show. Yes, we do have him lined up for a guest pick, so we're really looking forward to that. But 
he's got to do some weird thing like a honeymoon or some something yeah. like that. But <laughs> anyway, congratulations. And then the last comment we're going to talk about comes from Scott Abraham, where he says, my hot pick is true first, such as Hulk 180. People are reevaluating what a first appearance is, making a distinction between first appearance and first full appearance, seeing more interest in the actual first appearance. And as Cole pick, Gideon Falls, saying it's a buying opportunity right now. Well, I, I love those both of those picks. Uh, Gideon Falls, definitely, I, I'm real bullish on. And it, it's, you know, it being cold right now, like we said, it's a spec cycle. But they are coming with a production from Hive Mind Production, the team led by Dinesh Shamdasani, uh, who's also the production team behind the upcoming Bloodshot movie. I have real high hopes for what Gideon Falls is going to be able to do on the small screen. And I don't even call them true firsts. I call them actual first appearances. I love the fact that the market is starting to get on board with what you and I talk about, Brian. A first appearance being truly a first appearance. Right. So we want to thank everyone for those comments. Make sure you guys comment on this video as well because we will continue to spotlight some of these comments each and every week on this Hot and Cold show. But let's get into why you're even here in the first place, and that is for this week's Hot and Cold list, starting with the first hot pick this week from CBSI and the spotlight writer, Andy Tomberlin. Hey, what's up, CBSI Nation? Andy here, Indie Spotlight Series, comicbookinvest.com. What's hot this week? Well, we saw it about a month or so ago on the list, Spawn. Spawn is absolutely on fire right now, and it's it's across the board. It's no specific issue. Um, we just saw, shout out to Tim Walker, the Rights to Walker report. He's the one that, that, that put it in front of me. Spawn 299 Boston Fan Expo, selling for 250 to 300 right now. Um, you've got Spawn 265. There's a first appearance in that one of King Spider. That that book is on the rise. You've got Spawn 185, which is one of my favorites, the headless variant. Uh, that book is now a $60 book. Spawn right now is go to dollar bins, dig them out, pick them, and list them. Y you never know. You never know what Spawn books are going to catch. The 290 all the way up to, to 295. Uh, run right there. There's so many spawn books that are catching fire, so don't count them out. If you find them in dollar bins, they're they're good pickups, especially if you can find the newsstands one, newsstand edition. So hot pick of the week, spawn across the board all the way. So Jake, before we get into Andy's pick, we give Andy a hard time a lot on here, especially with this Clemson swag, which I'm sporting the Florida State swag tonight, but. I do want to give him props, and I think he kind of reminds me, if he were to grow that goatee out a little bit, and we even talked about AJ Styles a little bit, but we could get the whole OC going here. If he grew that goatee out, he looks a little bit like Carl Anderson to me. I can see that. I could definitely see that. But <laughs> now, we just, now we just need to fill out the rest of the club, so we got to find, I don't know. <laughs> I, got, I got the Luke Gallows ball yeah. head going. There we go. <laughs> There we go. Either way, people are like, what are you talking about? We're talking about wrestling. <laughs> but anyway, hot pick. We're talking about Spawn. Now, well, a couple weeks ago, we had Dan talking about some of his cold pick was that little Spawn run. We have seen some rebound. But I think it's important also to know Spawn is gaining steam. We're seeing these issues gain in value. But it's not like every Spawn issue out there is going to gain in value right now. You need to know which ones to pick, right, Jack? Definitely, definitely. Um, and the interesting thing is that the Spawn movie seems to be kind of dead in the water. So this isn't movie spec pick driven, which is usually what we're talking about when we see trends like this. It usually happens because there's some sort of media announcement. And, I mean, Todd McFarlane's been extremely transparent about the struggles with financing and, uh, you know, getting the Bloomhouse on board with what he's trying to do with the Spawn movie. Uh, we saw some great casting news with Jamie Foxx and Jeremy Renner, and then things just kind of died. But... The thing about Spawn is it has a fan base that has is just rabid, and they just want every book. A lot of run builders, a lot of set collectors, um, a lot of master set collectors. And you and I, Brian, we've covered things like Power Rangers, GI Joe, um, you know, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Spawn. Really, albeit an independent property, fits in with those kinds of properties very well because it's been a cartoon, it's been a movie, it's had toys. 
it has really be, been a property that a lot of people have grown up with. And because of that, there's always going to be that niche fan base. So like you mentioned, not everything is popular. It's certain stuff. Well, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for those those early, like under 100 newsstand editions. They are much rarer, believed to be around one for every 100 copies of a regular edition. Those are tough to find. Um, and then obviously condition becomes essential. We're talking those issues kind of in the late 100s, like he mentioned, 185 in that run. That was during maybe the low point of spawn sales. And at that point, some of those issues just had minute print runs. Like everything else, Todd McFarlane just can't seem to – he talks about things with hype and excitement, but delivering and get, seeing them come to fruition isn't always Todd's strong suit. Right. And I didn't like how he said there wasn't going to be that many covers for Spawn 300. Then we see a bunch of covers for Spawn 300. <laughs> oh, yeah. And even even in the announcement where he said there wasn't going to be a bunch of covers, he still named like eight covers, and then it's only gotten worse. Yeah. So there we have Andy's pick, and we're going to roll right into the next hot pick this week, which comes from Run the Tables author Clint Jocelyn. Good morning, CBSI Nation. This is Clint Joslin coming to you with my hot pick this week. And my hot pick this week, it's interesting, it continues to show a healthy market, and that is anything related to Blade Comics. Older stuff, old, old stuff, and even new stuff is really starting to move. And what's of interest is you're seeing lots selling. So I think you're seeing people wanting to complete runs. Uh, and these aren't going for astronomical prices or anything really that high, but I really look at it as a healthy market because the books are just moving. I think people are rediscovering these blade covers, rediscovering some of these variants that there are, and, and buying them. And that's always great because it helps the market. Yes, the Tomb of Dracula stuff will always be popular, but that really is something that uh, for a lot of people is a different price range that makes it more difficult to obtain. But I really do th see the, the variants and you know some of the stuff that's probably 10, 15 years older really starting to move. So it's a healthy market for Blade right now, which is great. This is what we need in the comic book, not these huge yo-yos up and down depending on pricing and then two weeks later uh, it comes crashing down. Yeah, they're only going for five or seven dollars, sometimes you know, 10, 12 dollars, but it's a healthy market where people can get in and the books are hot. So my pick this week is anything doing with Blade Comics. So what people don't know is that Andy and Clint were both in the same car in a Sonic drive through So that's where they filmed their hot, hot and cold picks. <laughs> not, not really. And it's kind of ironic how both their picks come up back to back and they're in the car filming it. So I just thought of those Sonic commercials. <laughs> but... Then we have Clint's pick, though, Jack, and he's talking about Blade. Blade, especially since San Diego Comic-Con, the news cycle has been vicious, and a lot of his books are starting to take off. We're seeing those older books, the older titles that weren't, that were, like we saw, like we said, we're sitting in dollar boxes. The Tomb of Dracula 10, that's starting to take off out of people's reach, so now you, people start, now you see people starting to grab that low-hanging fruit, and they're starting to flip them, and they're seeing price increases on those books. But what do you think about this, Jack? Well, I mean, I don't know how you can argue Clint's pick at all because, yeah, obviously uh, Tomb of Dracula 10 is a monster. It is beyond out of people's reach. I've kind of given up the hope that I'm going to own one of those. Uh, I'll have to wait for the spec cycle because it always exists and when that when that kind of book drops back down. But we've also seen like the origin issue um, from Tomb of Dracula run and um, some of the other like minor first appearances that involve Blade and the Blade storyline, the Blade mythos. Those are popping off. And then we saw that Blade number one, that first solo series, just shoot up to $40 and be a major CBSI Hot 10 list book. Now, we saw this past week, number eight, with the crossover with Morbius, which we now know is probably never going to happen now that Sony and Disney have kind of split ties and are going to go their own separate ways. So that book might die in the water, but it doesn't matter about that book. The point is there is such a fervor for Blade comics right now, and there just isn't a ton of different options to choose from. I agree. I think you pick them out of those dollar bins whenever you can because you just don't know what's going to be the next issue that's going to take off in the secondary market. I agree with Clint. Right. I would also be cautious, especially for if you're new to collecting and you're watching this channel. Draw a line in the stand how much you're willing to spend on these books because these books might go up in value right now, but once that movie comes out, these books, I think, might be sitting in those $5 boxes once again once that hype cycle comes back down. So make sure you're 
you know the level of risk that you want to buy in at and then stick to that because if you are planning on collecting this for investing the odds are outside of the keys that are already up there in value that's not that many that will go up as well they might a lot of them will go up and then fall right back down so that's the beauty of speculating because you never know what can happen but there are trends and a lot of these books end up finding themselves right back where they started once that hype comes and goes. Oh, totally. Definitely. Um, yeah, that's why I advocate buying these books in bins. You know, if you're buying them for a dollar, that's great. But a g great example of what you're talking about is that Blade Number 8. That book shot up just because people anticipated the Morbius and Blade crossover that we now know is highly, highly unlikely due to Disney and Sony's business dealings. So I expect to see that book crash, and that book was just on the hot 10 list. Yeah. yeah, I think those books, they won't go exactly back down to where they were, but they won't retain the value that they're at right now during the, the apex of the hype. Right, I think that book goes from a $20 book back to about a $5 book, still five times its dollar book value kind of where it was, but I, I definitely don't think it'll maintain its heat so with the next pick on the hot list this week, we're going to get into the usual suspects author, Peter Renna. What's on, going on, everybody? This is Peter Renna coming to you live on location from Dewey Beach, Delaware, with my hot pick this week. And as much as I didn't want to do it, my hot pick this week is uh, Recalled Comics. Uh, you got to watch out for these things. A lot of times they heat up really quick and then they die on the vine. Uh, even the Supergirl and Supermans that were selling pretty hot on Wednesday for like $50 each are now maybe getting $50 a set. A lot of them you get for, get for 20 so the prices are already dropping, so you really got to be careful with these things. Uh, it's very similar to things like Saga 41 with that dark cover that got recalled. That's not really doing much, and Kid Lobotomy 1 with the uh, foil stamp error also really isn't doing much. Now, occasionally you do get the book that's going to get you something like the Action 869 that had the uh, beer recall with Superman, because for whatever reason Superman can't drink a beer, or that uh, Elseworlds 80-page uh, giant that had the microwave baby in it. Books like that are still going for a couple hundred bucks, so uh, those are rare. And uh, this topic, even though as much as I don't like it, is very interesting to me, so I'm actually going to write about this next week for Usual Suspects, so keep an eye out for that. But for this week, hot recalled comics. Jack, you know, What's for up, lunch man? today, I was going to get me a pastrami sandwich. But I didn't know where the deli was. And then the guy, it's right there. And I'm like, deli where? Deli where? Where's <laughs> deli where? <laughs> yeah, Peter Peter looks like uh, he's shooting a video for his dating profile right there. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm in deli where? <laughs> deli where? <laughs> but he knew we were going to give him crap for that. He knew. <laughs> yeah, he knew when he recorded it. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he's like, he's like ah, you went all Spielberg on us. I was losing the light. I had to go with that take. <laughs> he was too excited to talk recalled comics. Yeah. But we love you, Peter. And recalled comics. We touched on this last week, especially with that big release that came out. We talked about how much we kind of hated the recalled comics. But we can hate all we want. It is hot. I mean, it's people are out there buying these up. And he gave good examples of ones that retain value, and he gave a lot of examples that those that don't retain value. I kind of know you where you stand on this, but I want you to tell the viewers, Jack. Well, yeah, I mean, I got to say that I agree with uh, Peter's pick. Obviously, they're hot right now. We saw the number one spot and the number two spot on the CBSI Hot 10 Comics list come from Recalled Comics. But yeah, if you watched the CBSI Bolo show last week, if you watched even the Hot 10 show, because we kept it 100% real... Um, I don't like recalled comics. I think it's a gimmick. Um, I think that the only reason why they're popular is because they got recalled and somebody didn't follow instructions on how they were supposed to handle that recalled comic. And the relationship between LCS, distributor, and publisher is important. And it's important that people honor that. And so, yeah, I understand the collectability of the perceived rarity. But I'll give you another example is Wolverine 131, which has a massively inappropriate word in it and um you know i have found those all the time so for a book that's supposed to be recalled it's certainly out there and then when you go to list it how are you going to list it what are you you're not going to use that word in the in the title um so i you know i've had to list that and put like racist slang in the title or something like that it's just something that makes me uncomfortable so i just i'm not a big fan of recalled comics 
I don't want to go buying a Scooby Doo issue just because it has like a Hellraiser uh, advertisement in it, or you know any of the other things that have happened over the years. So yeah, Peter makes a good point about a couple that have had solid staying power in the market. But for every one that has serious staying power in the market, there's a dozen that get totally forgotten. And Brian, you mentioned last week the website recalledcomics.com. Great website, great resource. But um, people are getting insane with their discussion about recalled comics. The one that I see now that people keep talking about is Secret Wars number one the uh, from the original Secret Wars. Uh that's not a recalled comic. I know it's on recalledcomics.com. I know it's one that people are talking about. Galactus is blue in the issue. He was intended, apparently, to be blue. People didn't like it. So when they did the second print, they changed his color. They didn't recall the book. It wasn't pulled off of uh, shelves. I happen to have a half dozen of those. And when I looked through, each and every one of mine had the blue Galactus in it. That does not make it rare. That doesn't make it recalled. And that really won't add any value to it. But it's just what happens in today's social media age is somebody mentions that book on social media. And the next thing you know, you start seeing post after post after post about that. People want these recalled comics. They want these rare items. Doesn't mean that what you perceive to be rare truly is. And it doesn't mean that it should have any inflated value just because it's been recalled. And again... A recalled comic shouldn't exist. If it was recalled, it should be recalled. You, Nobody's going to sit there and sell a recalled baby stroller on the secondary market because of its perceived rarity. Um, you know, you're going to get rid of it. So I, I really just don't love this topic. And I know that I'm in the minority. Um, I know people seem to like it right now. It's a, it's a big niche. But, um, yeah, you're never going to get me hyped over this topic, Brian. Yeah. I mean, they both... We know we both aren't for recall comics, but yeah. it is hot right now. We fully acknowledge that it's hot. And if you are one of those people that loves chasing recall comics, that's you do you. We're all excited. We always say buy what you like. So we just want to know. We just want to make sure that you know where we stand because we're always about integrity and community on this channel. And yeah. we're not fans of recalled comics. So if you like these books, buy them. By all means, absolutely. But this is a speculation-driven um, community and channel, and we, so we also want to make sure we caution you to watch out. I don't think you should be paying the high market price that's currently being paid for, for instance, the Supergirl or the Superman in hopes that it's going to turn out like the Action Comics book. I don't know that that's the case. Exactly. But with that being said, we're going to move right on through the hot list, which is much gooder, as I told you earlier, and we are getting into the reading pile author, Dan Piercy. Dan Piercy of The Reading Pile here. Now, my hot pick this week, I feel like Andy Tomberlin over here shouting out another indie title, but it's Coffin Bound from Image Comics. I'm not talking about the regular title. I'm talking about the Ashcan. Now, when this was released two weeks ago, there were about two dozen copies of the Ashcan available on eBay. They're all gone now. The reader buzz for this book is very real. It's one of my favorite titles in some time that I've read. It's very Kafka-esque. It has that surreal type quality of a, a Sandman or a Pretty Deadly, if anyone's read that. The art, it reminds me a bit of 100 Bullets. Very accessible. I like it a lot. Now, I feel like I'm about to get a bolo-sized beatdown from Jack for picking such an unconventional title, but... uh. That's okay. I can take it. I don't have to be right, y'all. I'm just happy to start the discussion. So that's my pick. The Coffin Bound Ash Can from Image Comics. Ah! So there we have Dan's hot pick. And kudos for Dan for standing his ground. But um, the only, I agree, this is a hot title. The only problem I have with it right now with I think you're going to go into it also, Jack, is we don't have a big canvas to go off of. We have one issue. The issue is hot. But as hot as the issue is, and we hear this all the time, um, depending geographically where you're located, I went to my store and there's a bunch on the shelf. People went to their stores and there wasn't many on the shelf. There is buzz behind the title, but I want to wait till at least the first art comes out before... I personally decide this is a great title, this is a hot title, but kudos to Dan for standing his ground. And now, thank you, sir, may I have another Jack? 
Yeah, I don't like this pick. Um, and he, yeah, I mean, he can call it a beat down or whatever he wants to call it. But, you know, we're looking for hot and cold trends. And it's very hard to call a single issue a trend. He said it's his, it's one of his favorite titles. But he can't even really say that yet because we have one issue. It may be his favorite first issue. But that's all you can say. And you got to understand this. This is coming from a guy who read the issue and liked it. I actually think that this could be a long-term play, but I, I use the term could because we don't have a whole lot of basis other than what we've read in one issue. Um, and Brian, what you said about geographically, that's spot on. I live in South Carolina. This wasn't an easy find in this area, but in other areas of the country, I've heard the same thing, that this book is heavily on shelves. It's heavily available because in larger cities, they know to order Image Comics number ones. That's kind of like a go-to no-brainer. So I think it's going to take some time before we see some real return on investment on issue number one. If you just check eBay right now, you're going to see that this book is selling for $6 maybe plus shipping, which is solid. Because again, you add in the shipping. Those of us in South Carolina, maybe who can't find it, we're willing to pay $10 for it. But those of you in New York City, Baltimore, Maryland, Los Angeles, California, you're laughing at us uh, country bumpkins from South Carolina paying that $10 price tag for that book. So, uh, you know, again, you know, there was an ash can. That's just an abbreviated version of issue number one. It, just because it's two books, it's still the same book. Um, you know, I, they, there's certainly a lot of hot independent titles um, but this is maybe a hot independent issue. And again, I got to say maybe because I can name independent comics that came out the same week as Coffin Bound that are hotter than Coffin Bound. Um, that's just a reality. So I, I don't dislike the book. I don't think that Dan picked a bad book. I think on the Hot and Cold show, we want to see trends. And I think you can't call anything that happens one time a trend. So for that reason, I really don't like this pick. Um, I'm hopeful that two, three months from now, when we've got a few more issues in the bag, that I'll eat my words and I'll turn around and say, yeah, Dan, you're right. This thing is hot. This is solid. But what if issue two comes out and, uh, you know, excuse my language, shits the bed? You know, what, what, what happens at that point? What if it goes all fair lady on us? Right. That's that's a great point. And we haven't talked about that on the channel. Fair Lady was is a great title, a title that people liked. But we had James Hake, the CEO of Scout Comics on the channel, and he's really schooled us. And I've been using this as something when I'm investing. I've really thought about this. But there's a 50% drop off in independent comic titles from issue number one to issue number two. That 50% represents the speculation community because we all know there's far less speculation in issue two, three, four than there is in issue one. So if, what if this book drops off to such a point where the creators decide, well, this is no longer financially viable for me, which is what happened with Fair Lady. And now you're five issues into Fair Lady. And if you were holding that as a long-term hold, you're burnt. You're just sitting there holding that book because it's never going to be anything. I don't think a movie company is going to come pick up a comic that couldn't even sell the comics and couldn't get through their first you know, kind of run, uh, for, it was only five issues deep and they had to call it, which is unfortunate, but that's the economics of comics. And the reality of the situation is we don't know yet if that's the situation we're going to be in yet. What if there's some sort of lawsuit like happened with, uh, dead eyes, formerly dead rabbit. You, there's just so much. You just don't know that you can't sit here after one issue and go, yeah, this is a book that's trending hot. Uh, it's, it's just one issue. Issue number one did well. You got to show me what else you can do for me. We always say on the other end, give it, uh, give a, a new title, a full, full arc. Brian, you're a big advocate of that. But I got to do that works both ways. If I say don't dump on a book because you got to give it a full arc, I'll also say, you know, you can't call an individual issue like this is a hot title. Um, you and I are big fans of Once and Future, but they still got to show me issue number two and issue number three. Those issues got to bring the heat the same way issue number one does before I would feel like that's a good pick for this for this list. Otherwise, I'd be saying the same thing for about once in future. So it'll be anxious to see how this title does and if we'll see it on this list in the future. But we're going to move right on into the list now with Covertoons author Mike Morello. Hey, everybody. 
Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my hot pick this week. And this week's hot pick is kind of in tandem with my prior two weeks picks. I realize in the last couple of weeks I've chosen some pretty high-end big boy books that a lot of people just can't afford. And so this week's hot pick is kind of a solution to that problem. And my hot pick this week is mid-grade keys, especially mid-grade raw keys. The first reason is because they really are hot. These are the books that fly out of cons and they fly out of shops because people are the most excited to get their hands on books for decent prices, um, especially keys they've looked for for a long time. But the reason why that is is because if you find these books at cons and in shops, you've got a lot of room to haggle down condition. And if you can haggle down condition, you can haggle down price. And of course, that leaves a lot of meat on the bone. And that meat can allow you for a lot of profit potential. First, of course, is if you can sell the book at a higher grade than what you bought it for. Um, secondly, if you feel like you can clean and press the book and get a legitimate higher grade than you bought it for, you're going to get a lot of profit there. You also have the potential to sell to a larger group of collectors who think they can clean and press and grade the book, get a better grade and sell it at a profit. And then lastly, it allows you for potentially an exponential amount of trade bait for those books that you really have had trouble getting your hands on. Um, and maybe maybe this book is, you know, in mid-grade is perfect for you. The conglomeration of flaws doesn't bother you. It's solid enough for you and you want to keep it. Um, but for whatever the reason, um, these mid-grades are the ones that move. They move uh, a lot more units than the high grades do because high grades are expensive. A 9.8 is a 9.8. It costs what it costs. GPA is GPA and those prices will stay fairly static unless there's a new announcement for a key. Um, so if you want a high grade one and you want it pre-graded, by all means, Drop the money for it. Um, but otherwise, if you have trouble getting those big keys, this could be the way for you to make the proper amount of profit to get those keys and or trade up for them without spending any money at all. I realize trading up is kind of a trade secret, but it's not really a secret. Everybody does it. And this is really a great way to do it. I will caution you, though, not to go too low on the mid-grades that you buy. Be careful of a few types of flaws that a large group of collectors have a problem with. A lot of fading is bad. A lot of chipping is bad. So you want a, a book that shows well, that's fairly glossy, that you think you can move, um, and I think you'll do pretty well with that. Um, if Dan Piercy is the sell and sets guy, I am definitely the mid-grade raw key guy. I think it's the best place to make profit. It's the best way to trade up for those books you want to get your hands on, and I honestly think it's the most fun way to buy and sell. And that's my hot pick this week, everybody. Thanks very much. Bye. Oh, sorry. I was taking notes because Mike just took us to school. Which, Mike's a teacher, by the way, in case you guys didn't know that. Mike's pick, mid-grade keys, makes a lot of great points. We've talked about someone on this show, especially when it goes to selling. Mid-grade keys, especially raws, you can make good money on selling on eBay. People, a lot of times, people think, oh, I don't want this because it's not high grade. Nope. F it. Put it on eBay. I guarantee you'll get a buyer. And you'll probably be, put it up for auction. I guarantee you'll be surprised at what you'll get for an auction. Now, don't end that auction at like, 3 a.m. on a Wednesday morning, make sure you know when that auction is going to end and do that right. But I've seen time again where I've put keys up mid-grade, especially bronze and copper keys that I didn't think were going to do well, put them up for auction and was surprised at what they sold for. And a lot of that is for the reasons that Mike mentioned specifically in his hot pick video. But what do you think about this, Jack? I love this pick. And I'll even expand it from mid-grade and include low-grade. Um, I think where he was talking about the things that collectors don't like, I think that's important. It's all about presentability. Um, I don't have a problem if a book's a 2.5 or if a book is a 5.0. You can make money on all of it across the board as long as it's presentable, looks good, cover quality is there. Um, he talked about trades. I traded a Jane Foster Thor number one from 2014, a book obviously that's doing good money, but a book I've got maybe $3 into. I traded one for a Superman volume one number 199 which is the first race between Superman and the Flash. You're talking about an iconic issue. I was shocked that a guy brought a, a mid-grade copy to my booth and made me that offer. Um, that was an instant trade for me. While he was happy to have that hot book of the day that I happened to have multiple, multiple copies of, I was happy to get this Silver Age key book for $3. So when you talk about trading up, you have those kinds of abilities. Now, if I wanted to flip that into a trade for somebody else, they may value that book at $100, $150, something of that nature. Um, the other thing is, I noticed this a few years ago when I was really trying to expand my retail business and I, I really wanted to get as many keys as I could for my back wall. 
I went to Heroes Con, which is in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is a convention where it is a comic book convention for comic books. You know, you don't have the actors. You know, it's, it's all about the books. And you start to notice that a lot of these dealers, they have on their back walls five and six and seven of the same books. And I noticed that there's always that book that they love and they will not come off that price. And then there's the one, if you go down the line and you're at book four, five, or six, um, and those are the lower end ones, not only are they already priced cheaper, they're more apt to give you a deal on them because they don't love that low grade. They've got those high grades. Those are the ones they don't want to come off. So I did extremely well that weekend buying those mid to low grade keys. Well, guess what? They're all gone. I've flipped all of them. I've doubled, tripled, quadrupled my money. And it just changed my entire perception. If anything, I don't even hunt high grade anymore. I leave that to the big boys because the reality is while you'll make good money, oftentimes your margin is less. And ROI is what I care about. I want to make as much profit on my investments as possible. I don't need to be Johnny Cool with the minty copy of the book on my wall. I'd rather be Mr. Accessible. And that's the thing. We talk about the amount of young collectors entering the market, the amount of new collectors entering in the market. They are trying to get these keys. And we've talked about books that people are priced out of, whether it's Tomb of Dracula 10, Werewolf by Night 32. These are books that they feel like they can't own. So at this point, they will take any grade that they feel like is presentable that isn't going to embarrass them. And they'll take it for whatever price they can get it at that, as long as it's reasonable. So we're seeing some of these books really be able to move in. And I'm not even talking at that high of a level. I'm even talking about things like mid-grade ASM 361s, the first appearance of Carnage. That was a book that if it wasn't a 9.0 or better a couple of years ago, you wouldn't touch it. Now I'm seeing lower grades in that book move because the reality is the price has jumped up to a level where people want it. Uh, first Deadpool, First Venom, those are books that people want. Um, and then going back into where you know he's really talking about those Bronze Age, kind of Silver Age keys, it's it's just it's essential at that level. I would rather buy three mid grade keys than buy one high grade key for the same amount of money because I feel like I'm going to move my books faster because he mentioned that they sell more often and I'm going to get that higher rate of return than I am sitting waiting for that one spec play, that one customer who has to have that book and has the money to grab that book at the price that I need to turn that same ROI. So I would tell you, don't be bougie. You know, be happy grabbing whatever you can get and uh, take advantage of those dealers who don't view it the same way that Mike views it, I view it, or you view it, Brian. And you and you were exactly right about eBay. As long as you're honest, just be honest on eBay. Give plenty of pictures. Um, if you have to, don't mention a grade at all. Just go overdose on pictures. Just say mid grade. Yeah, mid keep it keep it mid grade, low grade, reader copy. You know terms like that that really describe the book accurately. I have sold some books in utterly terrible condition um, that I put reader copy in in the title and was stunned at the prices that they were able to get. People want to acquire these keys and they'll do whatever it takes to get them and make them fit within their budget. So, you know, if your goal is to make money, if your goal is to make sales, then you shouldn't be as concerned with that clout. And I, you see that at a lot of comic conventions, those clout chasers, those guys who just want the credit for having the beautiful books on the wall. I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. I look at it like two fives make a ten. Doesn't matter. I, I'll take that and be just as happy. Right. <clears throat> An example of one book that I constantly buy, made great, and then flip. Is that Green Lantern number 59, that Guy Gardner? For yes. For some reason, buy it mid-grade, I get it for low, and then I put it on freaking auction and always make at least 30, 40 bucks on it. Yep, absolutely. There's, there's And there's a ton like that. A lot of those Marvel Bronze Age books with the black borders that just, they're so tough to get in, in high grade. I, I'm more than happy to buy those books in mid to low grade and flip those books. That's a great pick from Mike, and we're rolling right on into the hot list with our true first author himself, the Mass Speculator, Topher S. What's up, everybody? It's the Mass Speculator, a writer of CBSI's True First, here with your hot pick of the week. I'm going to go with something a little bit different this week. Comic book merchandise, specifically vintage t-shirts. There have been some enormous sales for some of these over the last week. 
Most are incredibly rare and no longer made. That makes me think buying some of these isn't a bad idea. Stash them, hold them. Could be a good long-term investment. Finding vintage bargains is going to be difficult, though, but it's not a bad idea to keep your antenna up at flea markets, yard sales, and shops. To avoid bootleg stuff, look for tags still attached and check the neck tag. Many of these will have the company who made them and can be researched. See you next week. So we're talking about market trends and Topher's giving us vintage t-shirts. Now, me, growing up, I never got any of that cool name brand vintage t-shirt type stuff. Well, at the time it was current. <laughs> Everything I got was going to the mall and you see those iron-on stands. And I kept getting like the Dukes of Hazard and generally iron-ons on a Hanes white t-shirt and thought I was the coolest kid. But... Vintage t-shirts, I say vintage, vintage in general, there's a market for that. There's Netflix shows on people selling vintage stuff and they're making buku bucks off of it. Vintage t-shirts, especially comic merchandise, falls within that niche. But what do you think about this, Jack? Well, yeah, that's why I, I like and I don't like this pick. I, I like this pick because vintage t-shirts are hot. I, I work in the fashion industry um, and I know that right now the 90s specifically is the era where you're seeing a lot of money. So I have been Cross talking. Cross coming back? Yeah, a little bit, honestly, but uh, – um, I know Topher posted in our chat, um, you know, a Ghost Rider t-shirt from the 90s that went for like $300. And that is the kind of stuff that is commanding value. Those 90s style t-shirts where, you know, you can kind of tell, know them when you see them, the big prints. Where you have to be careful is today's companies have picked up on this 90s trend. So even if you go to Walmart, you're seeing some of the styles duplicate those 90s vintage t-shirts. So you have to be very careful. So you mentioned the show on Netflix that's called Slobby's World. I would actually suggest if you want to get into flipping those vintage t-shirts that you watch that show because he gives you a breakdown on how to tell the difference between a vintage sh shirt and a shirt that is made to look vintage. And it's all about the tag. So and it's not just looking at the date because guess what? People lie. And you got to watch out for that. Um, and, and you can do things like, like Brian mentioned, iron on an old t-shirt. Um, so you got to know – what constitutes a vintage shirt versus what constitutes a vintage looking shirt because so many shirts in the market are made to look vintage even the even the shirt i've got on right now the cbsi swag shirt you know this is that old school cbgb's looking style of shirt but this was just made this year this is a 2019 style yeah so look out for those canal street specials <laughs> yes yes we're looking at you mel <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the comic book ones are popular because really everything in pop culture is popular. You're seeing um, whether it's musicians or video games or movies and comic books fall into that. All of that stuff, that 1990s, 1980s even, vintage stuff is red hot right now. All right. So that's Topher's pick and we're going to move into our first guest pick and we have Thaddeus Prime. What's up, CBI Nation? Thaddeus here, a.k.a. Thaddeus Prime, from Mealhorn Gaming. And when I'm not gaming, you can find me talking about some hot books. Speaking of hot, let's talk about Boom Studios and how hot these guys are. You got their history with Bone Parish. You got their Faithless variants that are still selling for 20 plus on eBay raw. And a big hit was that Go Go Power Rangers Make-A-Wish variant. That one's still going for 35 to 40 plus. Now let's talk about Once in Future. We all know it went to fourth print before it even hit the shelves. That A cover alone is selling for around ten dollars. That thank you uh, variant once per one per store is still rocking around seventy five. And we just heard, I was it today that the second print has sold out and gone for around fifty bucks on eBay. That's nuts. Now on top of that, we have something is killing children. And that one has already been gone to second print. And Ross from Boom announced yesterday on Instagram the picture of that variant. And it's gorgeous. I'm going to have to get that on myself as well. And with all that, it looks like we may be having, may be having another once in future trend happening. I think Boom Studios is making some really big moves, some really big plays. And I'm excited to see what else they pump out in the future. But all these books... I mean, they're still doing great, and we have new stuff on the horizon we should really take a look at. 
Um, all in all, Boom Studios is booming. <laughs> Thanks for your time, guys. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter under Thaddeus Prime, co-host and writer for Mulehorn Gaming. And never forget what time it is. It's prime time. So there we got it, guys. Thaddeus Prime. Huge, huge thank you for the guest pick this week. Reached out to him. Was super privileged to have him do a pick for us on this channel. So we want to say thank you to Thaddeus. Keep doing what you do. And definitely check out Mulehorn Gaming. Especially if you're a gamer. They do a lot of great stuff on that channel. But his hot pick, Boom Studios, gave a lot of great examples. You know, there's no secret to us on this channel. We've had a rune on here. We are big Boom Homers. Be careful how I say that. But <laughs> <laughs> could come different. But either ways, we like Boom. We like a lot of channels. We talk about a lot of the titles on here, especially the ones that he mentioned well, I mean, yeah, obviously, I love Boom Studios. Boom Studios and IDW are my two favorite publishers in comics right now. Um, they've been my kind of low-key speculation plays for about three years now. And uh, I don't think it's low-key anymore. It belongs on the hot list. I'm happy to share it with the community. Boom has been doing great things for a long time. And they're just now starting to get the uh, kind of attention that they deserve. Power Ranger spec has been good spec for a long time. And now you're starting to see, he mentioned the Make-A-Wish variant. Certainly, the Make-A-Wish variant is awesome. Those showcase variants from San Diego Comic-Con are doing huge money. The um, the kind of like the White Ranger sword variant from San Diego Comic-Con, doing incredible money. Any of those really limited Power Rangers exclusive variants do extremely well. But even like the foil issues from issue 41 and issue 40, those are still selling well on the market. They're still getting sales on eBay. They may not have reached huge dollar amounts, but they're selling. And on top of it, once in future, I mean, what have we not said about that book on this channel? Obviously, that's a book we believe in. Uh, I think they're going to have another hit on their hands with Something is Killing the Children. We've talked about Which was just announced as now an ongoing instead of a miniseries. Right. And that, and we've talked about that one. Um, I think that's like the book that I could see getting a quick option as well. Um, so, yeah. And they've got another thing that I think people are sleeping on is that Angel and Buffy series. We talked about the possibility of that getting brought back for a TV show or movie, and they're about to do their big crossover Hellmouth. And I, I just, I think not a lot of people are paying attention to that. Those high ratio variants, whether it's the thank you variants for Angel or the like one in 50 Buffy variants, there's not a ton of those out there on the market. And once they dry up, you're going to be able to command your price similar to what we see with like IDW variants. And I've talked about ad nauseum on this channel. So I love this pick. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Thaddeus. His, his Instagram is exceptional and he, he's a valued member of CBSI nation and the Simpleman's comics family. Who's always reposting our stuff. That is something as the person who runs the Instagram with Brian, we notice and we, we greatly, greatly appreciate. So shout out Thaddeus, man. Um, you know, appreciate everything you've done. Great pick. Great pick, and uh, certainly one that Brian and I can get on board with. And not only was his pick hot, but holy cow, his apartment was hot. I'm a big guy. I like it cold, man. He had his thermostat at 74. I can't live like that, man. I was got to be like 70 or 69. <laughs> and I was like, the whole time, I was like, man, it's hot in there. But that's because his pick was hot. So thank you, Thaddeus. And we'll roll into the next guest pick this week. And we have... Adam from Strange Tales to Collect YouTube channel and Simple Man's Comics Patreon member with his guest hot pick this week. Hey everyone, Adam here with Strange Tales to Collect and I would like to bring you my pick for this week's Hot and Cold show, the CBSI uh, Weekly Hot Pick. Uh, I just want to start off by saying thank you <clears throat> to Jack and Brian for letting me be here. Uh, it's a great honor. I love watching the show, so I'm super happy to be here giving you all my picks for this week. And my hot pick for this week is going to be um, that medieval fantasy genre um, in comic books today. All right, I want to go broad and I want to go big. So that medieval fantasy genre, and I'm talking books like Kanto, Once in Future, Oblivion Song, Die... Conan, Red Sonja. Uh, I'm not. I'm not highlighting these books <clears throat> because I'm telling you to go out and buy them. I'm just using these as some uh, examples right now that are in the market that have been going strong. Uh, there's a lot of good books that have been coming out lately. 
uh, in this genre. This 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 genre has been picking up. Um, it's been picking up heat as time's been going on. Um, you can look at any one of those books that I just mentioned, and they're coming out uh, strong. They're selling well on the, the secondary market for any number of reasons, whether it's that reader buzz, the storyline, um, those covers. All right, there's a lot of great covers. And uh, those those option news, whether it's uh, for Netflix or Hulu or, or maybe even a movie. A few of those that I mentioned on that list are actually already in the works and are being optioned. Uh, for TV shows, and for all those reasons, guys, books like this have been doing well. These books reach to a wide, diverse um, group of people, okay? Uh, comic book fans love them because they're great reads, they're great art, um, we really appreciate them, but also, too, it helps to go outside of that comic book um, collector, that comic book speculator, and these are stories um, that other people can relate to, uh, that they can get excited about, who maybe aren't the biggest superhero fans, um, and so it just it reaches a, a much broader um, range of people, and it's already got the heat coming from these option news and everything like that, guys, and, and I know everybody says it, I know everybody says it, that you know, um, this book, I could see this book really becoming an option for later on for TV or a movie. But these books, um, they have a great story. They're filled with a lot of information, a lot of um, different things that can be picked up and used for these shows. Uh, they can be huge now with the special effects and the CGI, and they can become really, really popular really quickly. So my hot pick of the week is that fantasy medieval genre type book. Thanks. So there we have Adam's Strange Tales to Collect is his YouTube channel. Make sure you guys check it out. A lot of great videos on there. And I want to take this time to say thank you, Adam, for supporting the channel through Patreon. But I loved his hot pick. He's talking about medieval fantasy books. We've talked about this somewhat on the Bolo Show. This theme is rampant right now through comic books. He gave a lot of good examples. But there, there was even examples like before what we've got right now with like rat queens that came out and then there was like what was it that coda book there was um shoot look at battle cats right now i mean medieval and fantasy is definitely a hot market trend which is what this list is all about well i gotta say that this is my possibly favorite pick that we've had in a number of weeks for one main reason it caught me off guard it surprised me um it made me think We've talked about horror as a genre on this show. I don't know if we've talked about any other genre other than horror. And I'll admit, like, medieval and fantasy are not two of my favorite genres usually to read books. And they're certainly not my favorite genres to watch movies. I tend to call, like, medieval times kind of movies old-timey. And that's not that's not really my type of thing. Uh, I, I like things that are set in more of a modern era. But it's funny. So when I saw this pick, I wanted to almost hate on it. And then he starts naming the books and talking about the books. And I realize, oh, my God, I'm reading a lot of medieval and fantasy books right now and really enjoying them. A lot of the titles that he mentioned, I'm very excited for. You mentioned Battle Cats. I can go Knights of the Golden Sun as well. Um, there's a lot of these kinds of stories that seem to have captivated the market right now. And there are a lot of these stories, as he mentioned, wouldn't have been good spec plays because everything in, in independent comics especially seems to be determined by the option and whether or not it can be made into a movie or a TV show. But with CGI being what it is today, almost nothing is off the table at this point. And uh, you, you, know, you can even add in Saga into the list of, of things on, uh, you know, in those kind of books. And there's just it – it's been a while since we've had a pick where I sat there and said, wow, I wouldn't even have thought about that. But he's exactly right. I don't have a single bad thing to say about the pick. I think all of those titles that he mentioned are hot for their own reasons. And I, I look at even like Marvel going with hard with Conan and multiple Conan series. It seems like Marvel is trying to get in on that world. Um, so without a doubt, we've seen Cosmic have its day in the sun. Uh, we've seen horror have its day in the sun. And I think that medieval fantasy, whether people realize it or not, it's having its time right now, and it's just great to see because you know what I love about comics? Diversity. When we're talking about diversity, we're not always talking about racial diversity or or you know diversity of genders. Diversity of storytelling genres, the fact that we've got all of these different types of stories. I tell my friends who aren't into comics, you can't say you don't like comics because there's a comic for every person. There's a comic book out there that whether you're into crime noir 
or any of those topics we just talked about, or you know, you want just a kick-ass kung fu type of book, these books exist. And they're on the marketplace. You just got to find them. So g- great pick, Adam. I absolutely advocate you uh, subscribe to his channel. He's put some great videos out. I talk to him on a regular basis. He's definitely uh, one of the better, newer YouTube channels that's popped up in the last couple of years. So I'm excited. I subscribe to his channel, and uh, I make sure to watch all of his videos. So I think I can't say enough about him, and, uh, and I, I'm excited to watch his channel grow. Right. And he's one of those guys, when we're talking about some of the info that comes out in the Discord channel, he's one of the guys putting it in there. Yes. Another reason why you need to be a Simpleman's Comics Patreon member, because you're getting access not just to me, not just to Brian, but guys like Adam. So there's Adam's pick, and that wraps up the hot list. But with the hot, we have to have the cold. But the good thing about the cold is a lot of times we say that those cold picks, while cold, do provide great buying opportunities. And we're going to get into the first pick on the cold list this week. And it comes from Andy Spotlight writer Andy Tomberlin. Hey, what's up, everybody? Andy back with Andy Spotlight. What's cold this week? I'm going to have to go with Jim Henson's Power of the Dark Crystal with a Netflix series looming coming out August the 30th. This book is ice cold right now. And there may be some buying opportunities if you're thinking there's going to be a spike when it drops now is the time to buy you can get a cgc 9.8 cover a for 29 to 30 bucks you can also get some of the variants the subscription variant and the virgin variant for right around that same price right now uh there's some auctions going on too i don't know i'm i'm a proponent of there's a show coming out if i can get a 30 dollar buy-in i'm gonna try it uh so that's just me but take it for what it's worth right now jim henson's power of the dark crystal ice cold and uh watch out for those second print variants also uh there's they're few and far between uh i only see one listing on ebay for them right now and they're actually up there so if that's a book that if you can find at the right price you, you never know when this show comes out what it may do so don't sleep on it Ice cold right now, Jim Henson's Power of the Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal, got a Netflix show coming, but the comic books, as he mentioned, are kind of cold right now. There is one book, especially from that series, that since it came out, it was hot from the beginning and still kind of demands good money. And that's that 1 in 50 Virgin J. Lee variant for issue number one. Fantastic cover. These issues might be cold, but I bought these. One, bought that J. Lee cover because I loved it. One, two, Huge fan of Dark Crystal because 80s kid. Movie gave me freaking nightmares as a kid. And three, Sanaa Takeda, artist for Monstrous, did a lot of those B covers, so I was collecting those. But he does have a point. A lot of these issues are fairly cheap. And normally with the type of buzz with the Netflix show, we talk about it. It usually creates hype. We're not seeing that hype right now, Jack. Right. Well, there's a few things that almost don't add up with this release. Um, you mentioned the connection with the 80s kids. Um, you know, I expect would expect to see people of a certain age to be looking for these types of books. They haven't yet. Um, also, this is a Boom Studios release. And we just talked about how hot Boom Studios is right now. And it seems to be getting overlooked. And I'll expand beyond ba- uh, Power of the Dark uh, Crystal. All of the Dark Crystal titles, all of the series is really just aren't trading for very much. But again, that's the beauty of the cold list. There are buying opportunities there. We've seen with uh, Cannon Busters that just released on Netflix. That was one that had almost no heat going into its release. And then once it got released and people started watching it and enjoyed it, suddenly it saw an uptick. Don't wait for Dark Crystal to come out and for it to be like well-received to then go chasing the books on the upswing. If you at all believe that this is something that can possibly be hot, now is the time to get in on it. I don't know, to be honest with you. I'm all, I'm all over the place with this one. I could see this one certainly being very hot. I think we could be talking about this title on the hot list in the next several weeks. But at the same point, it's hard because at, right now when you look at it, it kind of makes no sense that it's as cold as it is, but it is. So, you know, maybe there won't be a crowd for it. Maybe those, you know, warm and fuzzies that Brian gets over this one don't, don't really translate to other people. And I always have a hard time with that. Um, is, is this something I love or is this something that other people love? And that's always a tough judgment call to make. But, look, we've invested in a lot of books over the years and we've, you know, burnt a lot of money in investment books that just didn't pan out. 
I think this one you're safer because Netflix has such a wide distribution. And we talk, obviously Brian alluded to it. We've talked about this on the channel a lot. And if you're going to take a shot with any streaming service, Netflix is the one you want to do it with. So there we have Andy's cold pick, and we're going to go right on into the next pick. Hey, everybody. Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my cold pick this week. And this week, I am going with Major X. My How the Quickly Mighty Have Fallen. Uh, first print, number one, $8 now. <laughs> First appearance, yes, Rob, this is the first appearance, whether you'll sign it or not. 15, 16, 17, 18 bucks, not the $50 it once was. <clears throat> Second prints, cover price. All the other issues, cover price. Yeah, I sat on them too long because I had a little faith in good old Rob, but I shouldn't have. Obviously, Rob has given us some, some great characters in the past, um, you know, Cable and Deadpool, obviously, but. Um, I think this is really more of a cautionary tale for new characters. We're getting just bombarded with new characters, new villains, new heroes every week. We run out Wednesday Warriors, we go grab all this stuff, and we try to pick and choose which ones we think will have staying power, and sometimes we get stuck with the ones that aren't really worth much. Could these characters all find their way into movies or TV shows eventually? It kind of seems these days like every freaking character is going to end up in a movie or a television show. So they may all be keys eventually, but for right now, I would be very wary about new characters. Uh, and uh, if you're going to get in, get out fast. So that is my cold pick for the week. Thanks, everybody. So I see this pick, Jack, and I immediately look in your direction because I know, one, you're a Rob Liefeld fan, and we've talked about Major X before, but he does have a point. It is kind of cold right now. Does that, does that hurt your feelings, Jack? I mean, really. Does it hurt your feelings, or do you think it's going to rebound? You, you know what? I'm, I'm a Rob Liefeld optimist, so... In reality, I kind of like that it's getting cold. I, I, like Mike, I held on to my Major X. Um, I wish I would have made a stronger spec play on Major X than I did. I made a larger spec play than most people did. I have several sets built. But um, I didn't see it getting as hot as it did when it initially came out. But again, that's the power of Rob Liefeld fandom. The reality is, he's, we talk about on this channel, he's a polarizing character. And it's important to note that because depending on what perspective you sit at, you could look at a guy like Rob Liefeld and say he's garbage. Or you can look at him and say, well, he's a comics legend. And because of that, because it depends on where you sit on that spectrum, um, you may only look at it from one certain perspective. And the bottom line is for things to get hot, people just have to be talking about it, whether it's positive or negative. And yes, we talk about the spec cycle. The spec cycle on this book, the series is over. So the book is trending downward. Having said that, issue number one is still double cover price plus shipping. And issue number zero, which is the most recent issue that came out, still has certain covers trading at double cover price. I look at that and I say, well, there's still potential there. Plus, Rob Liefeld has already let us know that this character and these characters, because he also created the team, the X Command, are going to come back at some point. So I believe that now is a great time to pick up these Major X sets, these Major X number ones, these Major X zeros, and get ready for whenever Marvel integrates them into the, some regular stories or Rob Liefeld drops that next Major X story. And if again, if it's not for you, it probably wasn't for you from the get-go. I think anybody who believed in it from the beginning is probably still on board. I enjoyed the story. I thought it was a great story. Uh, it was everything I kind of got the feeling of when I read Deadpool as a kid. So for those reasons, I like this one. This is a cold pick that I'm comfortable with being on the cold list because, again, buying opportunities. So that's Mike's cold pick. We're talking about Major X, and we're going to move right on to the next pick, which comes from Clint Jocelyn. Good morning, CBSI Nation. This is Clint Jocelyn coming to you with my cold pick this week. And my cold pick this week is high ratio variance. I think it's a great thing, actually, and I'll explain in just a second. But if you really look at the market the last couple of weeks, specifically towards 1 in 50, 1 in 100 variants, um, they are moving under ratio. And for those of you who are not familiar with what that term means, let's say it's a 1 in 50 book. That book is moving for anything less than the $50 price range, or if it's a 1 in 100, anything less than a 1 in 100. But what you're really seeing is a drastic shift. Some of these 1 in 50s are going for 
five, ten, fifteen dollars. Some of the one and one hundreds are going for thirty or forty dollars. Um, and, and irregardless of the publisher and or uh, the comic character or anything like that. Now, is this a good thing? Potentially, it's helping uh, reshape the market to where it should be. Uh, also, it's giving opportunities for people who may not have had a chance to get some of these books um, at you know reasonable cost, able to do that. So it is definitely cold. I think people are shifting their uh, resources elsewhere at this time, which is a good thing because a cold market doesn't necessarily mean a bad market. It just means at this time, people are not paying over ratio for these variants that are a dime a dozen and, and many times and really if you're looking to invest um, it just doesn't seem like that's the place to invest your money but really watching the market as of recent late there's other things that you could do with your 50 or 100 dollars even your your one in 25s in a sense so my cold pick this week is high ratio variants of any kind but on the flip side of that go out and buy them they're great deals right now do your homework check it out so we got Clint talking about high ratio variants as cold picks. I agree with them, but this is one of my favorite things because there's about two times a week where I go into eBay and I just do search one in 100 variant or one in one, whatever these high ratios are. And then I go and I buy it now and then I sort. Next thing I know, I'm picking up high ratio variants for super dirt cheap. But I know speculation is cyclical. And I think some of that stuff's going to come around again and that'll be the perfect time to flip those books. Well, I, I like this pick. It's definitely cold. And I like what you just said. I'll even throw in there, watch out for those live auctions because, you know, a lot of them, people put that one in 100 variant up and they are crying when that book goes for $12. And that, that's a great purchase opportunity. But here's the thing. You got to ask yourself why these high ratio variants exist. They exist as incentives for the retailer. And you got to look at who is getting the most of these high ratio variants, these store exclusive variant producers. And we've talked about this on the channel, but if you're new to the game, if you're new to the channel, this is the thing. Those stores are the ones who are getting a large number of these. They're, they end up owning a high percentage of the market in general, just the stores who are producing these variants. And they, a lot of these stores that are producing a variant this week and then a variant next week, they've got to keep their money turning. So they're moving these high ratio variants quickly. And in order to do that, they're willing to take far below ratio. They're kind of going rate in the comic market for a long time was when a book got released, you sold it at ratio. So if it was a one in 100, you sold it for 100. If it was a one in 25, you sold it for 25. Those days are kind of gone and we're seeing that price drop more and more. I'm seeing one in 100 variants sell in package lots a lot of times with a one in 50 and a one in 25. And when you start pricing them out, it ends up being as low as 40 to $60 for that one in 100 variant. And when you start that low, and then you're doing it on series like, say, Black Cat or um, – I don't know. I could keep going, but any number of these Marvel series that aren't – Absolute Carnage. Yeah, yeah. Absolute Carnage is a hot series at least. Yeah, but they, they got a lot of them. Right, and we just – we talked about that last week where you know you got two 1 in 25 variants. You've got multiple – you've got a 1 in 50, a 1 in 100, a 1 in 200, um, 1 in 500. And when you start doing that – it doesn't take a retailer that much to get their money back, which is what they're trying to do. They're trying to flip those ratios quick, get their money back, and then, then they can slow sell their individualized retailer exclusive variant. That's affecting the market. So it, it is very dangerous to go out and buy those books from places like Midtown or TFAW based on what they're charging for high ratio variants on release date. I would suggest you do what Brian talked about. And eyeball eBay for those releases because play that eBay is the real natural market. It's what things are really trading for. And I just don't think that the high ratio variants are really doing anything for us speculators on the secondary market. They're truly just incentives for the retailer who is purchasing a large quantity of books. It, it is the, it, the market doesn't get set until they're in the, in the collector's hands and then the collectors are reselling them. And that has been very hard to predict over the last year, I'd say. So they're definitely cold in that they're not selling for ratio. I will still say there's a lot of demand for them. People still want them. They tend to have some of the best cover art. So we're seeing a lot of that, like those hidden gem variants and things like that. So just something to keep an eye on. And you got to change your process and your strategy up. So I would, I would listen to Brian. Look at those cheap buy it nows. And uh, you know, look at those live auctions and kind of follow the books that you want 
to try to get your hands on. And I would say even some of those even higher ratio variants, like the one in 200s, the one in 500s, very rarely do you see those retain that ratio value. It's almost like buying a brand new car. As soon as it comes off the lot, it depreciates instantly. That is a great point. But, so thanks for that pick, Clint. And we're going to go into our last cold pick. And we're going back to Adam from Strange Tales to Collect once again. Hey, everyone. Adam here again with Strange Tales to Collect for my cold pick of the week. Um, and this one I'm actually happy to be talking about. Uh, the collector in me is happy to be talking about this. And the pick that I'm going to go with for my cold pick are those Marvel Phase 1 through 3 Infinity Saga um, books. Now, I know what you're thinking, guys. These books are still expensive to buy. They're still sought after. Um, they're still holding value. And you're correct about all those things. But the reason why these are my cold pick right now is because the market has shifted its attention to Marvel phases four, five, and six. All right? And now that the demand is dropping down for those Marvel phases one through three books, um, people are going to be willing to make deals. They're not going to want to hold on. They're going to want to be selling them so that they can pick up the next book to speculate and flip on. Um, and these books are great to have. Uh, I mean, you're talking first appearance of the Avengers, Silver Age appearance of Cap, first Iron Man, appearances of Thanos, all those keys that have become even more and more popular because of the MCU uh, are now going to either stay about where they're at or you're going to start seeing those prices go down. And as a matter of fact, we've already seen prices start going down for some of those books. So if you've been wanting some of these books, if you have been hoping that you could add some of these to your collection, not necessarily for speculation purposes or for flipping purposes, but because you genuinely just want these in your personal collection like I do, uh, now's a great time to pick these up, guys. Um, everybody's focused on 4, 5, and 6. Everybody's already past Phase 4, and they're speculating on 5 and 6, and it's just going to continue um, to cool these books down more and more as everybody's attention gets focused further and further on the future. So... Great time to buy. We want to buy low, sell high, or we want to buy low just to keep in our PC. So my pick for cold pick this week are those Marvel Phase 1 through 3 books, those Infinity Saga books. So there we have another great pick from Adam. And we're talking about Marvel MCU Phase 1 through 3, or Infinity Saga books as he put it. I agree. The movie hype's come and gone. Some of those keys will always be keys and demand the price that they do. But there's a lot of spec books in there that I think will, that I think, as Adam mentioned, are worth picking up as they're starting to cycle down. What do you think, Jack? Well, it's really going to be kind of the guinea pig test on the market of what is going to happen to these books. Because, you know, with phase one through three, we got something that comic the comic industry hasn't seen. Yeah, there were movies before, but this was the most success that any movie franchise has ever had. And it's definitely had an effect on what we do as speculators and resellers, it, so much so that it kind of becomes the main focal point of investing. And with that, you start to look at, well, what happens, and I don't know if a lot of people really thought about it, what happens once these movies are have come and gone? Um, Tony Stark is dead. So any Iron Man related book, Spoiler alert! Yeah. You have to look at it and go, well, what is the meat left on the bone with those books, you know? Um, even, like, great classic keys, um, like the 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 Man in the Bottle, was it Demon in the Bottle? Um, you have to kind of look at, like, an issue like that and go, well, they never did it in the movie, and now he's gone. So it's never going to be a movie spec book. So because of that... You kind of got to look at that book and go, yeah, it's always going to be important. It's always going to be iconic for comics history, but it's never going to really have any spec movement on it. You can look at books that did have spec movement, like you know Iron Man 304 and 305, the first Hulkbuster. Now, you may still see Hulkbuster, but you're probably not as prevalent a book going forward as it, as it was. And we're not just talking about Tony Stark. I mean, uh, Steve Rogers, Captain America has come and gone, and this is something we're going to see more and more. We're going to see the we're going to see more of these stars leave the MCU, and their time is going to be coming gone. And then we got storyline, Civil War. So there was a time when you could sell that Civil War set for one hundred and fifty dollars because everybody had to have it when the movie was coming. Now that the movie's gone, 
It doesn't move like it used to. Inf- and he talks about Infinity War, Infinity Gauntlet. Um, you know, Man, remember any- when those Captain America books when uh, Winter Soldier was coming out? Those Captain America books like took off. Right, right. You know, I'll, I've, everything related to uh, Winter Soldier, death of Captain America. A lot of people anticipated Captain America's death. We never even got that. So you look at that issue. Um, like, you know, oh, they're filming a funeral scene, y'all. Yeah, everybody got excited, and and, and now um, you know those those moments have come and gone. So uh, anything Thanos related now, Thanos could come back certainly because we're talking about you know the, with the time stone, anything's possible. But the reality is, you know, all of those like random Thanos covers that were popular probably won't retain the value that they did. Um, anything, those, any remember those. Um... The Starling Captain Marvel books, that the Thanos, the origin of yes. Thanos, all those books that were skyrocketing. Right, right. This, I, even something like Thanos Quest, um, the George Perez series. You know, those are series that I just don't think, I don't think, they're always going to be important, like you mentioned, but I don't think they're going to command the same um, demand in the market. And you and I talked before we got on the show where I said, you know, I've set up at several conventions recently. I've still got a ton of Infinity Gauntlet sets and Infinity Gauntlet number one. And it's not that people don't like the book. It's just that they're not asking for it. That's not what they're looking. They're looking for that next phase. That is just the way the comic buyer has become. So everyone's looking for those Blade books or, um, you know, that Jane Foster Thor stuff. Whatever's next up in the mcu that's what they want and because of that they're not looking for some of those classic um stories and titles and issues that have already been touched on in the movies or that the movies never touched on and now that time has come and gone so it's going to be interesting to see over the next few years what happens with these books value wise but as a collector right take speculation out of it take reselling out of it yeah now you get an opportunity to buy these books at reasonable prices compared to where they've been in past years. And this is why I say this is a guinea pig situation because if these prices come down to such a reasonable level, it's really going to teach us, not as speculators, not as investors, but as collectors, to be patient and to wait till the movie has come and gone and then pick those series up because it's going to be way cheaper for you if you always wanted a Civil War set and you just wanted it in your personal collection. You can pick that up now for fraction of the price that you could have picked it up when that movie was out and you felt like you had to have it. So avoid the FOMO and wait till a later date to pick those books up. But we're going to get a chance to kind of see how this plays out in the market over the next couple of years. This will be an interesting one to pay attention to and maybe come back and touch on later at some point, Brian. So I agree with you, Jack, and I want to say thanks once again, Adam, for that cold pick, and that's going to wrap up the hot and cold list. So we're going to bring the list up on screen right now for you. So there we have hot and cold together for this week. What do you think about the list, Jack? Uh, The list as a whole, I really like. I think it's a very accurate representation of the market right now. And it's exactly what we're looking for from the hot and cold show. Um, We want to kind of highlight those trends, and there are plenty of trends to take a look at here and to kind of implement when you're out there hitting those back issue bins. And like I mentioned, there's even a couple on here that caught me off guard that made me think. And I hope that you guys out there in the YouTube comic community, Simpleman's Comics family, that it made you think and maybe will affect your spec strategy going forward. Right. Also, want to make sure that you guys are aware this show is brought to you by CBSISwag.com. So if you want some of the CBSI, like the shirt that Jack has on, or the ball caps, make sure you check out CBSISwag.com. I want to thank our guest pickers, Thaddeus and Adam. Thank you so much for providing the picks tonight. We have more guest pick coming up. Next week, I believe we have Cat Run Figures from Cat Run Figures' YouTube channel, but also from the Comet Core group. So she's going to be providing us picks next week. And as we said, we have Wolf Warner coming up. But more importantly, even so, tomorrow night at 9 p.m., we have the CBSI Bolo Show. Right, Jack? Absolutely. And I am excited to talk new comics. We've had a hot few weeks on the CBSI Bolo Show. We're seeing um, increases in 
live audience, increases in total views. We appreciate it. It is um, probably the most fun Brian and I get to have going back and forth with the banter. Uh, we let some things fly last week. We're definitely going to do it again this week. And uh, we got a lot to talk about. So I'm excited. The list is already out. I'm sure you guys have already checked it out. So be ready and get in the live chat and uh, make your voice heard in the discussion. Also, I don't know if we're going to announce it tomorrow night on the Bolo Show or not, but sometime this week, we do have a pretty big channel announcement. Right, Jack? Absolutely. And uh, don't forget, when we say big channel announcement, we mean big channel announcement. Remember our last one. So be on the lookout. We've got a big channel announcement. Uh, We're not taking anything away. Instead, we're adding something. So definitely be on the lookout for that big announcement. And with that being said, we'll see you guys during the premiere of the Bolo Show tomorrow right here, 9 p.m. Eastern. Thank you guys and good night.